All right, everybody. Um, it seems like we could go ahead and get started and uh, we'll welcome folks as they are able to join us. It's great to see all you again and see some familiar names. Um, I'm sorry to those of you that appear new to me because I was not uh, logged in last week um, to see any new folks that might have joined us. But just a quick announcement that I want to make. If you are not currently receiving the invitation emails from me or any of the other communications that we're sending out that come from me, um, feel free to chat me directly um, over Zoom and send me your email so I capture that and get it onto our communications list. Um, and I will repeat this message in the chat as well and add my email address if you want to email me directly, um, whatever works for you. But we just want to make sure everybody who's logging in, um, whether you're getting this information forwarded to you or otherwise um, that we can get it directly into your inbox um, nice and efficient and available to you so again thank you everybody for joining us today um, we are going to hear from craig tomlin and emma clarkson um, we have craig on the uh, agenda first um, so craig i will turn it over to you to to take it away and we'll have some questions for you at the end so you should be able to share your screen and have all the other permissions let me know what you need as you um, get ready to share with us all right uh thank you very much um just let you know, about 20 minutes ago, everything went black when I was on with my supervisor. I hope it doesn't happen again, so we'll see in a couple of minutes, but hopefully not. All right, so we're going to share this screen here. Um, will you guys let me know if you can see it? We can see it, Craig. That looks great. All right. So hello, everyone. I'm Craig Tomlin. I'm with uh new jersey bureau of shell fisheries um like i said i'm glad that you guys have this thing going on i uh i have the i don't think there's anybody else from new jersey so if i uh mess up facts or tell lies nobody will know so that's a good thing for me um also uh i'm i'm hoping that this is, gets what you need i had to shorten up i had a, a original presentation that was I, know, I got really long, so I had to cut things out, and hopefully I didn't miss anything. Um, so we're going to start out with uh, New Jersey's uh, management and enhancement programs. First off, where are we? We're in, we're in New Jersey. Um, it's only like 130 miles of coastline, uh, about a half million acres of estuaries uh, and inland bays, uh, but it's a very diverse state. We have everything from the cities like Trenton to the highlands to the pinelands to our crowded beaches on the Jersey Shore and our crowded beaches on the Delaware Bay. Um, we, we have a little bit of everything going on here. When it comes to oyster management, um, it's pretty complex. Uh, we have a lot of uh, government inputs. Uh, first, we're under the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection uh, and they're charged with everything from air quality to um, site remediation. Under that, we moved down and we're Department of Natural and Historic Resources. Um, and that is the like parks and forests, as well as all the uh, historical sites, such as like indigenous people's burial grounds. Following up on that, we're one step lower. We are in the New Jersey Fish and Wildlife, um, where we do everything from lands management for quail populations to uh, trout stocking, um, and everything in between. Then we get to the Marine Resources Administration. Uh, this name's currently changed. We were Marine Fisheries, now it's Marine Resources. And that's because this encompasses everything from artificial reefs to studies on American eel. And finally, you get down to my group, which is the Bureau of Shell Fisheries. Um, and we're charged with all the shell fisheries in the state from the three mile line inward, as well as uh, SAV and rever reviewing of permits from for all construction and marine areas. But that's not it. We need to work with non-governmental people here. Um, we have uh, quite a few councils. Uh, we have the Fish and Wildlife Council, which um, has a lot of power in the state. They actually, um, uh, I guess it's hire and fire our director of uh, shellfish or of a uh, fish and wildlife. So if we don't make them happy, they change who's gonna be in. 
Uh, under them sits the Marine Fisheries Council, which helps set commercial and recreational quotas for our um, marine fisheries, everything from striped bass to flounder. And then we have our shell fisheries councils. I say councils because we have two of them. We have one that does the Atlantic Coast uh, back bays and one that does the Delaware Bay side of things. Um, and just for reference, I am in the Delaware Bay office where we do the majority of oysters, but we'll get into that as, as we go further here. Um, our councils are comprised of active shell fishermen and they're appointed by the governor. So they're like an advisory body, but they have a couple of really important duties. Um, and the first one we're gonna get into is leasing of bottom for aquaculture. Um, I know we talked about this. Uh, this is one of the things that was on the agenda. And this is, let me put, the only people in the state of New Jersey that can actually approve a lease are our councils. They approve it and then we finalize it. Um, it's an interesting way it works, but it came back from the oyster wars in the 1800s that everybody knows about. Um, so the councils, like I said, are divided into two sections. And on the Atlantic coast, uh, we have about 210 leases, uh, 2,200 acres, and there's about a thousand leases there. On the Atlantic coast, it's almost all, well, it was all hard clam. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, oyster aquaculture happening on the Atlantic coast now, but it's still mainly hard clam. Um, on the Delaware Bay, there's about 130 leases, uh, 32,000 acres of lease bottom. Uh, the leases are much bigger because they lar use larger vessels uh, and that's primarily oysters. Um, and this lease bottom can be used for uh, both traditional, which is on bottom aquaculture, and structural aquaculture, meaning water column based um, floats, um, bags, racks, and that all comes down to the permitting for the area. Uh, we don't actually do the permitting, but we help inform the permitting for those areas. We also have 100 acres of um, aquaculture development zones. Um, the, we have way more than 100, but we have 100 permitted right now that are, people are using. Uh, these areas are for the development of new aquaculture practices. The state of New Jersey holds all the permits for them. And then um, a user comes in, acquires the lease, and gets to practice multiple different kinds of aquaculture on the same area. The leases are quite a bit more expensive, but they don't have to go through the permitting process. So just to give you an idea of this, you know, what we have here, it's clam screens. Uh, this is traditional um, oyster culture where they plant shell and hope to catch a set. Uh, these are rack and bag systems on our flats. Um, there's you know oysters in in the, each bag and they keep rotating them till they get uh, to the commercial size. Uh, this is one of the on bottom cages. We actually have floating cages. Uh, the new craze on the our side, on the Delaware Bay side, um, in the deep water, are these large, large systems. This is uh, four, five foot by five foot. Um, they house a lot of oysters. Um, they haul them on deck and they power wash them multiple times uh, a year, and they're getting really good results with them so good of results that they've even modified them to these new things. Um, this is, you're looking at 12 foot long, six foot tall, five foot wide. Um, they rotate um, by the tide to create a, a better cup in the oyster and to clean the oysters automatically. This is a patented design by one of the companies here. They're so heavy, they have to be brought up by like clam dredge vessels, ex clam dredge vessels. Um, so this is all permitted in deep water, uh, you know, 10 foot of clearance above them. A um, couple of things about our aquaculture industry. We don't have great numbers on production. Uh, through some of the permitting, we're starting to get some numbers, but we, we have no way to, as of right now, to mandate um, 
production numbers. All right, so we're gonna go on to the wild harvest side of things. Um, we have a, a hand harvest. Um, it occurs mainly in our bays, riverine estuaries. Uh, this is tongs that are used. We do have some people that use, that actually literally go out by hand. Um, it's a really small fishery. It's 1,500 bushels a year. Um, there is no stock assessment for this. Um, yet we are working on better understanding of all the areas. Um, and we hope to do something very like an informal stock assessment and move the harvest from year to year in the near future. Um, our big oyster fishery is the dredge boat fishery. Uh, there's currently 80 licenses hold, license holders. Um, and now the quota is set by a formal stock assessment. Um, to give you an idea of how we got to the stock assessment, I'm going to have to give you guys a little history. Um, this is the Mars River uh, where my office is in the 1920s. And you see every sailboat there is an oyster dredge vessel. Um, it was it was a booming industry. Actually, in this area, it was the highest concentration of millionaires in the United States in the 1920s. Um, everything was done by sale. Then in the 50s, um, the, uh, the, well, I'm sorry, after World War II, a lot of these vessels uh, got motor, uh, diesel engines became cheap, so they were just converted over. And these vessels still work today. So the vessel right there on the screen, the bottom is 130 years old and it's still working to this day. Um, as you can see, there was just oysters. The railroads would cut, that came in from both New York and Philadelphia and they would load rail cars up with oysters, shucking houses everywhere. Um, so that was the, that was the, the high times of oysters. Uh, as you can see here that, you know, one to 2 million bushels a year, it was sustained by oysters brought up from the South. Um, if they were not brought from the South, that this would not have worked. Um, so how did that fishery work and how's it different from today? So what would happen was the oysters would load up, uh, I'm sorry, the vessels would load up oysters and bring them down to their lease grounds. And then they'd plant them on the lease grounds. And then in the winter time, they'd come back and harvest them. Um, it worked, it worked for, you know, hundreds of years, but we had a problem. Um, MSX came in. Uh, I know that, uh, it's a, you know, you guys, uh, I believe most of you guys understand the disease regimes that we're living in today. Um, so MSX hit in the fifties, then it hit again in the eighties. Um, and then Dermo hit in the eighties, then hit really hard again in the nineties. So this had had to change the way we're doing things. And the reason it had to change is because if you look at it, the mortality of oysters in New Jersey, in that 90 to 95% range is where we were moving all the oysters. So it made no sense to move them down to almost certain death. Um, even though this uh, shot is, is designed for MSX, it is essentially the same picture with Dermo here. Uh, Dermo is way more prevalent, uh, way more deadly in the lower part of the bay than it is in the upper part of the bay. So what do we do? Um, change oyster management. So we went to a direct market fishery. So instead of the uh, oystermen moving the oysters from up the bay, down bay, and then harvesting them months later, they were able to go directly from the seed beds to market. Um, it's been a great practice. Uh, I'll get a little ahead of myself here, but um, it's actually opened up a summertime fishery here. Um, our uh, oysterman, uh, we have really tight time temperature constraints uh, due to Vibrio, but our oystermen are willing to um, go and work within those time temperature constraints because uh, the price of oysters gets driven way high for them in the summertime. That's a little ahead of ourselves. We'll get there in a minute. But um, so because of that, uh, we formally started a stock assessment in 1999. Um, 
the stock assessment review committee um, is groups from Rutgers, uh, from the industry, from Delaware, um, from academia, other fisheries management people from around the country, as well as the Shell Fisheries Council and people from my shop, the NJDEP. Um, in the stock assessment workshop, we use that to discuss all kinds of things from exploitation levels of oysters to the shell planning to transplanting to monitoring assessment. Um, so how's it work? How's the stock assessment work here? And how's it work with management? Um, Rutgers University leads the research. Um, they contract us as well as um, commercial vessels to um, do the, the population of disease surveys. The entire bay is broken down. Um, well, let's say there's 30,000 acres of seed beds and it's broken down into regions. And I believe, yep. So if you look here, the regions are from a relatively lower mortality region in the north to a relatively higher mortality in the south. And that's how we break them down throughout the uh, bay. And each, if you look at each polygon, each polygon is a separate bed. Um, they're, they've been delineated through the years through their oyster lumps as they do move, but the oyster lumps themselves had names in the um, 1800s and we, we use those traditional names now. Each bed is then broken down into 25 acre grids. Um, those grids are sampled um, throughout the year. Um, then Rutgers and us do months of monitoring weeks of calculations and a two to three day um, meeting where we have graphs and negotiations between the oyster uh, fishers and the scientists and the managers. Um, out of those three days, we get all kinds of graphs. So this is number of boats, catch per unit effort, um, the, the size of oysters caught by the fishery versus the size of oysters caught in the survey. These are exploitation rates. Uh, we go through, we have um, mortality for beds. We have the, um, I don't even know, survey efficiency, uh, dredge efficiency for all the units. So what ends up coming out of our two-day um, meeting as well as months of work is this. Um, and this is a our harvest, basically our harvest goals for the areas, broken down by region. Um, and you'll see that the top says transplant region, the box bottom says direct market. We will we'll get to that and we'll explain the difference uh, a little bit further on. But I think one of the important points to look at here is the exploitation rates. So if you look at the top part where it says or transplant regions. The exploitation rates are of all the oysters in that region. So that is the maximum allowable exploitation rate in that region. So you're talking, you know, less than 1% to 2.5% of the oysters in that region. Now, if you look at the differences when you look at the direct market exploitation rates, that is the exploitation rate of oysters that are 2.5 inches and, and above. So it's two different things to look at. So they're not really comparable in this. And then it sets from there, we set our uh, quota bushels. And then it's up to my office to enforce what's going on. So we split that quota up amongst our participating license holders. They pay a shell tax um, for each bushel prior to prior them harvesting. Um, we monitor it through daily call-ins, weekly harvester reports, weekly dealer reports, and area closures. Um, the area closures are once uh, one of those regions hits their goal, we shut it down and they're no longer allowed there. Um, what comes up in the end is something like this. Uh, this is, you know, from 2009 to 2022 this year. The initial quota is the 
and this is going to be, I hope this isn't difficult. To, the initial quota is what was set by the SARC. The final quota is what we would be allowed to harvest once all the transplant activities have happened. And then the total harvest is what was actually harvested off the beds. And if you look, the final quota and the total harvest run almost identical throughout the years. Um, there, you'll see one year, 2015, it looks like the total harvest was greater. And we believe that was just an accounting issue on our oystermen, not actually an accounting issue um, for the number that were harvested. Um, I don't know if I should pause here on the management side and get some questions on that side before we go into enhancement. Um, it, and I'll just tell you now, if, if you guys have in-depth questions about stock assessment, I can point you in some really good directions. Um, it was put together by Dr. Powell, uh, Dr. Bushek, and Dr. Morrison. I work with regularly, and I'd love to sit down with anybody that has questions and give you guys our perspective and their perspective in way more detail. We have, and I can actually put a link in somewhere of uh, the stock assessment uh, paperwork that's put out every year. Um, so I don't know if you guys want me to talk about that, any more of that with questions now, or should we go on? I'd say let's go ahead and go on, Craig, and um, people can put questions in the chat um, as well. Okay. All Thanks. Right. So in New Jersey, we do a couple different kinds of uh, oyster enhancement. Um, seed planting, uh, I'm gonna just briefly talk about this. We don't do much of it. Um, we do, a, uh, currently we're doing a little partnership with um, um, a co-op. Uh, we purchase the shell, they, or the purchase the seed, they grow it out, and then we plant it on some of our smaller beds. Um, that was, this year, I think it's only 175,000 oysters. It's very small. Um, we do transplanting. We do shell planting. We do shell planting in the small scale as well as the large scale. And in large scale, we do direct plants and we do replants. Um, our transplanting program, which is what we were just talking about, how we enhance the fishery. Uh, we contract commercial vessels to load oysters from the areas that do not have a uh, direct market quota. They have a, a harvestable quota, but it's not, a, they don't go to the market. Um, in the green here, you'll see that uh, those areas are the areas that we consider the transplant beds. So they're considered a slower growing area. Um, their oyster quality isn't as great. So what we do is we harvest, we, get those commercial vessels, um, hire them, and they move a certain percentage of oysters down onto the uh, harvest areas. And you can see in the orange there, there's a couple of plants. They're the, they're the last 10 years worth of plants. Um, there have been millions of bushels transplanted in the Delaware Bay, millions. Um, this is paid through the colch count. Um, this is gonna keep coming up through all uh, my presentation, the Colch count is that $2 tax that uh, it's actually a self-imposed tax on our oystermen that they pay per bushel. Um, the idea behind the transplant is it increases the usable quota and enhances the bed area. Uh, Rutgers has done quite a few studies on, on these areas. Uh, when I say quite a few, uh, over the last 15 years that I've been here, I've probably seen five different studies on, on just transplanting. Um, and it's shown to increase the bed condition uh, of that recipient bed, uh, as well as the surrounding grids. Uh, and what I mean by um, increase is it increases the oysters per meter square, as well as uh, um, the size complexity of the area. The next thing we do here is we do small scale shell planting. Um, mainly in the river mouths and coastal bays. Uh, we have two different programs. The one is the Tongers areas plants. Uh, these are the areas where it's hand harvest only. We do direct plants and it's again funded through the culture count. Uh, the Tongers also pay a $2 self-imposed tax for every bushel they harvest that goes right back into account. And then we buy shell and plant shell with it. Um, 
the next program that's a small scale program is our shell recycling program. Uh, this is a relatively new program. Um, it's uh, we uh, in a cooperative with Rutgers, Stockton, the Jetty Rock Foundation, as well as several other um, restaurants and casinos in the area. Um, our staff go and they go to the restaurants and pick up. Um, well, let's go here. They use a, a dedicated trailer to pick up uh, oyster shells that the restaurants um, put aside for us. So they take the top shell off and put it in a in a bucket for us, and we, you know, we take it about once a week from multiple different restaurants. So we've done, I think, seven thousand bushels in the last four years. Uh, they're on pace to do like four thousand bushels this year alone. Like I said, it's a small program. Um, it's really good PR. Um, we're looking to expand it um, into other areas, uh, and it does. It catches a set. It it's been um, it's been a pretty pr pretty good program so far, even though it's in its infancy. Um, then we get to our large scale pro programs. These are mainly in the Delaware Bay um, because that is our largest area. We do direct plants and replants. So. The direct planting is where we place the shell on the bottom and hope Mother Nature does it. Um, the replant is uh, where we plant shell in an area uh, of high recruitment, and then hopefully we get it out of there before disease and predation eat all the spat. Um, the reason we can do this in Dollar Bay is that we have a, it's like a natural gyra, and in on the if you look at your screen i believe it's on the right hand side for you guys where the arrow points a lot of the set ends up there every year even if we have set failures throughout the bay we end up with set on everything that sits in that in that cove area um so we try to take advantage of it um we find the we find a ground in that area and then we have to find a ground that we're going to put the uh the actual shell on. Um, we plant the shell very dense. Um, I say very dense, very dense for us. It doesn't sound like it's very dense for North Carolina. We're talking, you know, two inch, three inch relief, um, not much more, maybe four inch at max. Um, then we use a, a suction dredge to move that shell as soon as we feel it can take the move. Um, you know, sometimes these, the suction dredge ride will be three, four hours up the bay. So uh, we wanna make sure the, the spat is not just pinpoint size. The problem is it's about three times the cost of a trick plant and we're still dependent on natural set. Um, if you look here, this is, well, this is one of our contractors. This is the suction dredge here. It's about a four foot wide vacuum that goes along the bottom. Uh, it does really good at picking up shell. Um, this boat, it'll hold five, 6,000 um, bushels of spatted shell at a time, and then it gets blown overboard. Um, well, why do we do it? Because that's the results. Every shell ends up looking like that. Um, we rarely use it right now because the, the cost is so high. Um, it, like I said, it's about three times the cost of planting shell naturally. Um, and we get we usually get really really high set numbers. And the reason I put an asterisk here is because if you look, I'll go back to that. If you look at that picture, how many of them are actually going to make it to adult? Not many of them. So while it looks really really good on paper for the first couple of years, um, by year five, it it's definitely not as good as it did in the first year. Um, so what we do, the bulk of our enhancement is direct plantings. Um, we bid out this work to contractors. Uh, we use tugs, barges, um, but we all, every time we specify the the draft, we specify the minimum loads. Um, Delaware Bay, the key is timing with everything for the first year. So if they can't make the windows, we don't want them. Um, and we specify the methods how they're putting over our shell. Uh, we're Definitely don't plant that dense. Um, 
we plant about 1,500 to 2,000 bushels per acre. So we're under, under an inch. Um, our average site is 25 acres. Uh, and one of the cool things is I can go out today on one of our 2003 shell plants and still find newly set oysters on shell from 2003. That's um, pretty cool to see. Uh, this is just a picture of one of our contractors that's, you know, 18,000 bushels of shell going out. Um, so this is our shell plants from 20, or sorry, 2003 to 2022. Um, we're averaging like 140,000 bushels per year. Uh, we'd like to do more. Um, this is fully funded through the... Um, culture count which is the you know the self-tax um i say fully funded because now um we are you know with the price of fuel and everything going up we're looking at next year as the first year we're gonna not be we'll, we'll be able to fully fund it but we're actually going to start losing money on our shell account um and i guess that this is one of the things that everybody talks about does it actually work um this is from 2010, we had a Army Corps grant, so we were able to study a lot more things back then. Um, but this kind of shows in the blue, you're looking at all native shell. So when we go down on survey, um, you can do a calculation based on area and density. And we know how many oysters per native shell there were. And then we can look at the recruitment on planted shell. And now the planted shell is less than one percent of the area but you can see the amount of recruitment it puts into the water or puts into the uh grounds all right so i'm going to try to wrap this up um lessons learned uh what we do we plan on existing reefs um in areas that they actually do work uh it seems to work well um this timing is key factor for year one to be successful and the reason that is in New Jersey is we have um, right around the same time that uh, the oyster spat is set. We, we only get one set a year. I, I know some people in this may get two or more, um, but right around the same time of year, we have uh, tunicate sea grapes that are set about the same time. And we also have um, coral sand um, that, that takes over areas right around the same time of year. So if we're too early, the shell's not available year round. If we're too late, the oyster, the set's gone. Um, location is a, a key, a key factor for multiple year success. So what I mean by that is we can be successful on year one in an area that just has a hard bottom, uh, get a whole lot of set, but two years later, that's going to be sanded over, or mudded over, um, and we can't find it. Uh, even if we dense, even if we um, plant very dense, uh, a lot of our experiments show surf clam, oyster shell, quahog, limestone all work well. Um, we currently um, only use quahog and surf clam for our large plantings, oyster shell for our small plantings because it's harder to get a hold of. We've not started using limestone because we have not gotten to that point yet, and our current permits do not allow that. They may in the future, but I do not know. Um, we found that industry involvement has been key. And the reason it's been key is because they get behind our projects. If we need the ear of um, someone in office, they will make the phone calls. Um, and they, they've been in the process since the start of the stock assessments. So they know and trust where we've been. They trust the process um, and continue to move on with us. Um, we haven't done any sanctuaries in New Jersey. Um, we have had one area that was going to be a sanctuary, quote unquote, for 10 years and then become a harvestable area. The problem is it is one of those areas that was not a bed beforehand. So it was very unsuccessful. Um, there was a little bit of time and money put into it, but it wasn't much. Um, and I think this is, we need to, everybody needs to be inventive for the future sources of culture, um, where we find them, how we find them. Um, 
one or two, I think this is a, a one or two more slides and we're done. The under oyster management, um, we do a three prong approach, which we have the researchers, uh, which are mainly ruckers on the Delaware Bay side, uh, the managers, which is my office and the industry. Um, like I said, it's worked really well. Everybody's in from the ground floor. We have constant communication. Um, and it, it really seems to make the process work because we listen to what the, the guys that are making the money off the, the bed say. We listen to the researchers and we kind of try to put it all together. Um, we use the area management. Um, the problem with area management, it's the only exact as the data we get. What I mean is that uh, if Joe Oysterman calls and says he's on this bed and he's actually on another bed, it doesn't really um, mean a, mean anything to us unless we can verify it. Um, so we need to work on that. Um, we need mandatory reporting on New Jersey for aquaculture product. And the other thing that's becoming painfully uh, apparent here is that we need to be able to write rules that are flexible. Um, for the current management and future management. Um, remember, I, I was talking about this culture count. Well, we have in the regulations as $2 per bushel. They set it up, but then we put it in regulation. Well, they currently want to increase that to 3 to $4 a bushel. We can't increase it right now because it's in regulations. So it's one of those things that we need to find a way to write rules that are way more flexible and allow for these adaptive management plans. And I think that's it. I do have one more slide. If uh, I know somebody was asking about, um, I guess, money back. Um, this isn't my paper. This is uh, um, Catherine Alcox. She worked at Rutgers Lab. Um, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner there, uh, they have a, a $40 return for every dollar spent. Um, like I said, this is back when we had some money to study some of this stuff. This is the Army Corps study uh, she used numbers she used um and i believe it was uh, i don't remember where the economist was but she gave me this slide also at the time um so i'm going to stop there and uh, answer any questions if you guys have them thanks craig um very interesting um and a lot of layers that um some of us don't have to deal with it's just interesting um but thank you very much we had one question um about the leases um, that you are working with um does everybody have requirement to use all of their lease and they have um sort of production numbers and um do you feel like your leases are being used up to their full potential or is there a lot of area that's not being used um they are definitely not being used up to their full potential um we so on the we have we have two different i guess ways on delaware bay um there is plenty of area open and they are definitely not being used up to their potential uh they're they use parts of them um we have no production numbers uh except for the guys that have a a license for the upper beds they actually have to report so we have those numbers on the atlantic coast which is a different animal they um they're space limited um and they then again are not um making the most of their grounds we do not currently have use requirements um it's something that we're working on on our aquaculture development zones, which was the ones that are issued by us, we do have use requirements because we there's such a limited area. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, and just to confirm, your shell tax is two dollars a bushel. Currently? That is what it. That is what it is for the uh, wild harvest. Yes. Wild harvest. Okay. Yep. And then um, from Galveston Bay, they were asking for your direct plants. Um, do you how high is your relief there? Okay. Your shell um, thickness when you're planting. So the, the uh, our shell thick for our direct plants yeah. is it, we consider it a dusting. Um, okay. It's uh, you know one inch for our direct plants. Um, and I, I actually I have the chat up here. I somebody asked about covering up existing 
yep. reefs. So uh, I'll, I'll talk about both of them at the same time. What we found here, um, our reef structures are, um, they're large. They've been worked with a dredge for multiple years. So they're, the top parts of them are relatively flat with, you know, little lumps here and there. Um, but what we found is when we do the shell plantings, we, we're just adding clean substrate to the area. So we're adding that, you know, half inch to inch clean substrate at the right time. And it doesn't necessarily cover up the other oysters because we're not putting that much on top of them. It actually just falls in between other oysters and creates a more interstitial space. Um, so we don't really increase the relief at all. We just add a, a clean substrate. All right. Thanks, Craig. Yep. Jason Peters raised his hand. Go ahead, Jason. Hey, Craig. Um, really appreciate the information. That was a uh, that was that was great, and um, I got probably half a dozen questions here that'll probably raise more questions. But 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 what I'd like to ask you um, is more related to just total um, big big picture numbers. So, how much are you talking about? in terms of total bushels deployed on an annual basis? And then, um, and then what is, what would you say your total annual investment is in your restoration work? Uh, and then I have a follow-up question. Yep. So um, if I go back, I think I can. Um, total bushels, you can kind of look at what we do in a Delaware Bay as the the bulk of everything. So this year was about 120,000 bushels of shale. Um, we, we have, there's other little projects that do. Now we're talking about just shell compared to transplanting because that's a totally different animal. Um, and that uh, right now we're at like just over $2 a bushel to do that uh, total cost. Um, so, I mean, you can figure what, $240,000, something like that this year. Um, are what we try to do is a one-to-one. -one. Um, so for every bushel we harvest from these beds, we try to put one bushel shell back. That is that is the goal right now. Our our pie in the sky is two to one. For every bushel we harvest, we put two bushel shell back. But that's unlikely right now. So your your numbers are significantly better than ours. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you're able to purchase the shell and deploy the shell for $2 a bushel, um, we're, we're about four times that. We're not, we're not including, uh, I'm not including staff time in that, sure. our staff time, uh, because this is, it's through a contractor. So our staff time is, um, you know, a couple days verifying and a couple days, uh, it's, it's minimal compared to those numbers. So. Sure, yeah, um, yeah, st I mean, still that's, that's really good. <laughs> I'd love to pick your brain about how you guys are doing that. Um, and then my, my follow-up follow question is about the culture tax uh, and your culture count. Is that um, constrained by any kind of fiscal year or does that, is that sort of an open-ended, um, The your legislature never really comes for that type of thing? So uh, our legislator has um, threatened to come for it multiple times. <laughs> um, and because you see, like there, I mean, I don't know right now. But it's public record. I want to say there's a like six or seven hundred thousand dollars sitting in there. Um, that's a good pot of money, and every year it gets more. Like we use it every year, but what happens is as soon as they think about it, our oystermen say, "Hey, look, we put that money in here for X, um, and that's the only thing we use it for." And and they go, they kind of walk away. Sure. So it's one of the few accounts we've been able to save from everything. Yeah politics alone sort of protects it yep. great thank you very much yep all right um well thank you craig there's a lot of like jason said a ton of information and you know we're hoping that we can have more of these kind of in detail in detailed questions and discussions um hopefully when we get together in, in december um so uh we'll like georgia said in her email we're trying to how we're working on a place to house all these things and we can also have interactive um you can have you know, post questions on there that we can then collate to bring with us to the workshop. So thank you very much. And I'll let George introduce our final speaker for the day. All right.
Craig, thank you so much. Um, we'll probably be following up just to snag some of those slides from you for further sharing. But if anybody has any other follow up questions for Craig later on, feel free to contact us um, and we can get those questions answered for you. Um, so next up, we're going to hear from Emma Clarkson. Uh, Emma, you should have all of the sharing permissions and things like that for the screen. So let me know if you have any issues and you have the floor. All right, thank you. Let me just figure out all the buttons here. One second, I have three monitors. So let me make sure. Can you guys uh, see my presentation? Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah, that's great. You're probably seeing the right thing. Let me just get this moved over here. Okay, perfect. Hi, everybody. My name is Emma Clarkson. I'm with Texas Parks and Wildlife, and I'm going to kind of go over a little bit of information about our harvest and wild fishery. I'm going to focus mostly on our restoration and enhancement. Um, so it's a little bit simpler in Texas in that the fishery and the authority to manage the fishery in terms of harvest uh, limits and things like that. And the monitoring is all done by one agency, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and the statutory authority for managing uh, oyster populations and oyster harvest was given to the Texas Parks and Wildlife Commission, which is our, our governor appointed um, board. <clears throat> there are other agencies involved in general oyster management, such as the Department of State's Health Services, which obviously um, has closures based on health concerns and you know bacterial levels in the water. Um, <clears throat> technically, all of the bay bottom is owned by the state, and those leases are administered by the Texas General Land Office. So when we start talking about restoration leases and aquaculture, there's another state agency involved there. Uh, water quality concerns um, is, are managed by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, so that's also needed for aquaculture. Um, and we have several stakeholder work groups and NGO restoration projects that we kind of use as opportunities to get input and feedback on our, our restoration and our regulation and management. Um, uh, actually, we just had a, a stakeholder meeting yesterday. Uh, so we do interact with the industry and NGOs regularly. Just kind of a brief characterization of the oyster fishery in Texas. We have predominantly wild harvest on public reefs with uh, dredging. We don't have a uh, tong or diver quadrat harvest. It's all um, hydraulic dredging. Our public reefs, or and that's our unrestored, some of them are restored uh, or unmaintained reefs are about 75% of our landings. We have your typical harvest season, sack limits, minimum size for oysters, um, the typical tools of the trade in a manager's toolbox. Um, we also had a license moratorium in 2005 to limit the entry uh, into the fishery. Um, right now we're capped around 546 active licenses. And we do have seasonal closures based on oyster abundance. And so um, a few years back, the commission uh, delegated the authority to close areas to harvest based on over, an area being overworking to the executive director of Parks and Wildlife. So without a commission action, Parks and Wildlife itself can actually close an area if it's deemed to be overworked based on um, oyster abundance that we see in our monitoring. So that's wild harvest and public reefs. About 25% of our landings come from certificates of location or in other places you might call these leases or, or private leases. Um, this, these are areas where an individual has exclusive rights to the bay bottom and they maintain that bay bottom. They cultivate it with additional culture material and that accounts for about 25% of the landings. This is only in Galveston Bay. There's 43 areas around 2000 acres. Um, and just for reference, we have around almost 80,000 acres of natural oyster habitat in Texas, and roughly 50% of that is harvestable. Um, and oyster mariculture, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. It is new, so I actually don't have any landings information from that yet. TBD, I think our first harvest from mariculture was this year, um, so we don't have too much to report on that yet. So this is just to kind of show you the harvest areas that we manage oyster resources by. These are the Texas Department of State Health Service areas. So this is, you know, the areas that you would close based on, you know, human health concerns. Parks and Wildlife uses them as those management areas as well, just because it's simpler to have the same boundaries between the two state agencies. And so these are the areas that, so an entire area, which they're all different colors, would be open or closed at once based on sampling. 
Um, a note a few years ago, we did close several areas, six areas in total to oyster harvest. I guess you could call these sanctuaries um, in uh, basically because these were very environmentally sensitive areas dominated by inner tidal and very shallow oyster reefs. So pretty much the rest of the Texas coast is characterized by deep subtidal oyster rest or oyster habitat. And our fishery is very much a subtidal fishery. But um, if a few years ago, we saw a shift in pressure to these really shallow reefs and we saw a fair bit of, of habitat damage in these shallow, very sensitive ecosystems. And we don't have a whole lot of shallow intertidal reefs in Texas. And so these areas were actually closed to harvest um, in 2017. So just to kind of characterize the fishery a little bit more, this shows you the number of oyster licenses. Right, like I said, we're hovering right around 550 right now. Almost all of them are active. Like I said, we had a moratorium in 2005, which is why you see that really steep jump in the number of licenses because they had you know, six months or so to buy up as many licenses as they could. It was either six months or a year to buy licenses before they stopped. Um, so, we doubled the amount of licenses almost, uh, and then slowly we've seen them trickle off. And so right now we're working on oyster license buyback. We've secured a couple million dollars to try to buy some of those licenses back. And that's a big effort that we're focusing on right now. And then just to characterize the landings in the state since 2000, you can see our, our industry, the oyster industry in Texas is typically a 30 to $35 million X vessel value industry. Um, in the last few years with, you can see the number of sacks are very slowly, slightly declining and the value is slowly and slightly in increasing. Parks and Wildlife also does the monitoring. So the way that we determine what our bag limits and uh, our just general regulations are gonna be is we have routine um, dredge sampling. So we use a dredge, a hydraulic dredge. It's much smaller than the actual commercial dredge. Um, we do stratified random sampling. We do 20 samples in each base system. One of our base systems is a little bit larger, so they do more. Uh, and this is for long-term trends and relative abundance. However, given the, the recent in-season closures that I described earlier, we do additional more intensive dredge surveys in season. So far more than the 20 that you would do in the month. And they're directed towards areas that we know are being harvested. So we directed it's not randomized sampling. Like we are looking for oyster reef. We make sure we are on like the crest of the reef, make, getting good samples to look at what the abundance is in, in almost real time during the season. And then we will do a closure of one of those harvest areas that I showed you on the map if the abundance falls below a certain threshold. So um, I'm gonna talk quickly about off-bottom mariculture. I'm just gonna leave the wild fishery there and I'll, I'll take any questions later if you guys have questions about our wild fishery um, or harvest. So with mariculture, one of the key program points here is that it's very, very recent. We were the last state in the Gulf of Mexico to have off-bottom oyster aquaculture. We call it mariculture. It is off-bottom only. Technically, I think some could call our leases mariculture as well, but those aren't seeded. I, I will note everything that I'm going to talk about here, our restoration, um, our wild fishery, our leases, all of that, none of that is seeded. It all depends on natural spat set. Um, so except for mariculture, where you actually are obviously putting seed on shell in cages, floating cages. This program is administered also by Texas Parks and Wildlife. I know in some other states you have your Department of Agriculture um, or a separate department doing this, but again, Parks and Wildlife is your, kind of your one-stop shop for ho oyster harvest, monitoring, mariculture, all of that. Um, we do set aside 20% of the fees from this program to be used for abandoned gear removal. We have three types of operations. So the farms or grow up facilities, nurseries and hatcheries, <clears throat> excuse me, there are 10 lease terms for these maricultural operations. And there's no limitations on the number of acres uh, a farm can be or the number of permits an individual can have. However, there is an active use criteria so that people can't do what's considered spite leasing in other places. You can't just lease up a bunch of bay bottom and sit on it. You do have to demonstrate that you're actively using it. 
And then the Mariculture um, sites, there's a very intensive siting process that you have to go through to get approval because you have to avoid sensitive habitats. So there's buffers built in from seagrass, oysters, rookeries, shallow waters, because we have whooping cranes down here. So like the entire middle of the coast, you can't be in anything shallower than basically three feet deep. So the current status of this is we have three farms currently permitted and one hatchery permitted and then pending. So we're, they're still, they've submitted an application but we haven't issued them the final permit yet. We have three more farms and one more hatchery under that review. And I did wanna take a moment to point out something that is very unique to Texas um, in that we have two genetic subpopulations of oysters in our state. They're genetically distinct. And so there's a difference between the northern region and the southern region, and then we have a mixing zone. And so they're basically classified in a way that the southern region oysters can tolerate much higher salinities. We have hypersaline lagunas down there. They're, the salinity exceeds 75 parts per thousand sometimes. And so you have kind of very low and slow spawners that really tolerate these very high salinities. And then in your northern region, you have, you know, your typical mid to lower salinity oysters. And so some of the, if you guys are familiar with mariculture in Texas, some of the characteristics of our program are being having very, very, very strict biosecurity protocols with your brood stock having to come from the appropriate, appropriate region because we don't want to um, accidentally allow too much genetic mixing and kind of mess up this, this you know, genetic stratification that we have in Texas. So like I said, like I promised, my talk is mostly going to focus on oyster habitat enhancement and restoration. That is my specialty. Um, I also have Christine Jensen in here. She's kind of more on the fishery side and can answer any questions that you guys have about the fishery. So in the past decade, Parks and Wildlife has restored over 600 acres of oyster habitat using cult planting. We use basically whatever cult that we can get our hands on as long as it is clean and from an approved list of materials. So that might be limestone, river rock, crushed clean concrete, um, oyster shell, uh, basically rocks and shell. And we will restore reefs in closed waters, reefs in harvestable waters, we'll do sanctuary, we will do everything. We believe in more restoration is better. So we, we don't only do one type of restoration, we will do all of the types of restoration that we possibly can. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna kind of walk you through the history of some of the restoration projects over time so you can see how they've changed. I'm not going to kind of read all of the details here. I just have them up on the screen because I figured you guys might be interested. But um, the story I'm trying to tell here is that in the beginning of our restoration efforts, we started restoring around 2009. It really started picking up after Hurricane Katrina, Rita and Ike. We got fisheries disaster relief funds to the tune of four and a half million dollars. Um, and so we did 230 acres of what I'm going to call flat. So this is a three inch deep uniform layer of colch material. Um, there were some reef domes, kind of an experimental site with some reef domes, but for the majority of the site, this is this flats approach with uh, three inches of, of material. And we also paid to have industry members do bagless dredging over across uh, about 1000 acres where Hurricane Ike had caused such severe sedimentation that it completely smothered 50% um, of the reefs kind of down in the East Galveston Bay area. Uh, so we did some bagless dredging to kind of resurface reefs that had been um, smothered. So we're starting back in the day with this philosophy of cover as much ground as you possibly can with a thin layer. This is another project that's an example of that funding through the GLO and NOAA, the Coastal Impact Assistant Program. We also, so this was a grant funding. We also get a lot of donations from CCA. We had some grant funding from NIFWIF and the Gulf Environmental Benefit Fund. Um, and some restitution dollars from a kills and spills um, event. And so this is another 185 acres. So these are huge restoration projects covering as much ground as we possibly can with a very thin layer of colch, three inch layer of colch, trying to enhance this for the purposes of um, helping the industry recover after um, storms and, and, and injury. And these are all harvestable reefs. 
Back in 2009, we were also still doing sanctuary reefs as well. We had this one that was funded by the Southeast Aquatic Resources Partnership and in partnership with Galveston Bay Foundation. So we have done these kind of community-based events. And this is one where in 2009, we worked with community members to do um, reefs in closed water. So these would technically be sanctuaries because they're not harvestable near the end of their piers. So people could enjoy fishing on the oyster reef from their piers. And um, Galveston Bay Foundation helped with this one through oyster with an oyster gardening program. And so we've always been interested in both types. It hasn't always just been these big harvestable reefs, but we had to get, you know, a very specific source of funding, a grant funding to do this project. Um, and also we got NIFWIF funding to do another sanctuary style restoration in Sabine Lake. And so Sabine, it's kind of a de facto sanctuary because it is close to harvest. And obviously Sabine Lake is the area that borders between uh, Louisiana and Texas. So this is a non-harvestable area that we were able to do this restoration. And this is the first time that we use something called mounds where we place up the culch in a two foot high mound that's 10 feet in diameter and we space them 20 feet center to center. So there's kind of a mosaic here. So this is where we're starting to get into habitat mosaics with their restoration where you have you know, this 10 foot circle of oyster shell and then a 10 foot gap and then a 10 foot circle of oyster shell. And so you have this mosaic and that's gonna be important here in a second when I talk about our new projects. Also note that back in the day, this one, for example, we were able to do 20 acres of a mosaic for half a million dollars. However, um, in the last five, six years, the cost of culture material has almost tripled. And the, the dollar signs or the, the, the figure that you here see, the y-axis on this figure is um, <clears throat> the cost per cubic yard. And that includes all turnkey services for actually deploying it. So this is all done through contracted deployments. And so that's the barge, the deployment, the staff, all of that, and the material. So it's not just the material that's you know $200 per cubic yard. It's the entire restoration, but it has tripled in cost. So now we've had to ask ourselves, how can we stretch funding? How can we think creatively about um, how to do the same amount of restoration with less material because it's so expensive. Um, and so we've started kind of an adaptive management or experimental design with a lot of our restoration where we start playing with the size, the vertical relief, clustering it. So we create a habitat mosaic. So it's not just solid culch placement. So we have like little clusters of culch with um, kind of blank spaces between them. And I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of that. So this is the first one where we started kind of using an experimental design was on Grass Island in Aransas Bay in 2020. As you can see, we're now at $1.5 million. This is from another hurricane fisheries disaster relief funding after Hurricane Harvey. Um, and you can see how much more expensive the culture was. And now we're up to $167 per cubic yard when the earlier ones were $76 per cubic yard. Um, the mosaic of the restoration was around 30 acres, even though the actual footprint of the culture was around 24. And at this site, we were testing mounds versus flats. So I told you about the mounds that we used in Sabine, these two foot high, 10 foot wide mounds. And then the flats that we used to use and your flats are just covering as much area as you possibly can. So we used, um, I'm not going to go into all of the tools that we use in our oyster restoration design, but obviously water depth and navigation concerns is a big one, as well as the quality of the substrate, whether it's going to sink, how hard the substrate is, and that there's no live oysters there. Those are all factors that are considered in here because you don't want to put a two foot high mound of colch on top of a live oyster, obviously. So basically we designed the site to have both mounds and flats, and we are currently monitoring those to evaluate sneak peek, the mounds on the mounds have a lot higher density of oysters, larval output, faunal associations, habitat provision, all of that. But you do have to remember there's still a space of unrestored bottom between each mound. And so those are all some of the things that we're studying, you know, what is the effect of that space with another project I'll show you in a second. Um, in Keller Reef in the Matagorda Bay system, we are experimenting with the depth of culch for a flat. And so in this area, it was too shallow. It's a navigational area, so we couldn't do these two foot high mounds. We could only do flats. But we do want to know what is more sustainable over time and throughout harvest pressure is a three inch flat um, arrangement or a six inch flat restoration better. 
And so you can see, see here the, the price of coal is still rising. Now we're up to $206 per cubic yard. Um, the mosaic is 25 acres, but the actual footprint of the restoration is 11. So again, we're trying to get this mosaic that is reaching our restoration targets over a larger area, but we actually only have 11 acres of actual restoration footprint. Um, another experimental question that we're asking right now is kind of around those that halo effect around those mounds. So this is Dollar Reef in Galveston Bay. Um, now we're up to $215 per cubic yard. Uh, so we have actually 13.5 acres of restoration footprint put in the 35 acre mosaic. And so for this one, basically the question is we have these two foot high by 10 foot wide mounds. Some of them are spaced 20 foot center to center, and some of them are spaced 40 foot from center to center. And the question is, are you know, as you start spacing these mounds out further and further, what is that doing to the ecosystem services? Are you still, is this all still part of a, you know, cohesive restoration project? Or are these just little, you know, islands of culture with a desert of terrible habitat with them, especially once dredging occurs? So that's the idea with these mounds is once they begin to be dredged, it kind of pulls the material in and fills those spaces. And so just kind of monitoring that over time and seeing how that changes. Um, in Josephine's Reef, we actually just finished this one up last month. So this is all mounds, but we are experimenting with having a one foot high versus a two foot high mound. Um, this one, I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about this funding source. Everything that I've talked about up until now has been Hurricane Harvey Fisheries Disaster Relief Fund, supplemented by grants and donations. This one is actually from our shell recovery program. I'm gonna describe that more in just a second. Um, and so, yeah, so like I said, we're looking at one foot high versus two foot high mounds here. And then finally, in partnership with the Nature Conservancy and Galveston Bay Foundation, we are working on the Galveston Bay Sustainable Oyster Reef Project where we restored um, a sanctuary reef and that in this case, the sanctuary reef is a sanctuary because it was made with self-policing culch in that the boulders are so large that you can't pull a dredge across it. If you pull a dredge across it, it'll break. Um, in areas where you might not be successful getting a regulatory closure of a restoration site, which we don't typically get regulatory, like permanent regulatory closures for restorations, you can use these kind of large boulders to get around it. There are a ton of pros and cons to doing that. It is actually a very contentious topic, um, but it's kind of how NGOs and partners and Parks and Wildlife are thinking about how to get protection for restoration sites. So the idea here is that we have a sanctuary site and then we modeled the currents with tilt meters and ADCPs and we identified what would be downstream of that sanctuary site and we did harvestable restorations there. And so we're kind of monitoring that larval exchange between the sanctuary site and the harvestable sites. Um, so I said earlier that I would come back to this. So uh, we do have two state funded programs that where the industry pays into an account, the shell recovery fee and a uh, separate shell recovery fee. One is a shell tag and one is a shell recovery fee. So when they get their tags, a certain percent of that goes to restoration. Um, and they, they pay a fee and a certain percentage of that goes to restoration, as well as in 2015, we passed House Bill 51, um, which requires shellfish dealers to pay 30% uh, of the, or to return 30% of the culch that they harvest back to the bays or pay a fee so that we can do restoration to that same amount. Most of the dealers have chosen um, to put the culch back in the bay themselves. So basically what we do, Parks and Wildlife permits and leases an area. And because when you hold the permit and lease, you are liable for anything that happens on your permit lease. We actually oversee these operations too. So we have observers in the field and the industry will place recycled shell material or limestone onto these areas that we've permitted. This, this, this chart that I'm showing you here is actually um, old. We've had a bunch of... Um, dealer placement events this summer, and I just haven't updated it from the ones that are going on this summer because one of them is actually still in progress. So I think right now we're actually closer to 40,000 cubic yards of culch having been placed as a, as a product of House Bill 51. 
Um, and this kind of just shows you the map of where this is occurring. So um, I probably should have mentioned earlier, since since you guys are probably a little bit less Texas uh, familiar with Texas, we only have oyster commercial oyster harvest in the northern half of Texas. All of the lower um, where you have that other genetic population of oysters, there's no commercial harvest down there. Um, so this is why all of my maps only show the the upper half of Texas. I feel like I should just explain that a little bit more. Um, but you can see we have these sites, several sites in Galveston Bay. Um, a site in Aransas Bay and several sites in Matagorda Bay that have had dealer placements. And so that's where dealers are going out and placing the shell themselves. And then this is just showing the coastwide restoration that we've done, um, a combination of grant funding and fisheries disaster relief funding and um, the, the shell recovery funding across the entire coast. And like I said, we're, we're over just over 600 acres now. Um, if you are interested in any of, our, any of our data, we actually made a big push last year to get everything hosted. And so all of our data is both on our website and on AGO as a web service. And if you look at our restoration data set, you can actually click on each restoration and it'll tell you what year it was done, what kind of material it was done, whether it was a flat or a mound, how much it cost, like all of that information is in that AGO layer. And uh, with that, I will take any questions. Emma, this is Christine. I've been answering some of your questions in the chat. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> Thanks, Emma, and thank you, Christine, both for um, the presentation, for answering all the questions. Um, Christine, are there any in the chat that we haven't that you haven't had a chance to answer? The only one I think was what was the material used for the Sabine reefs? Was that River Rock? That was River Rock. Yeah, that was correct. We switched to limestone. I mean, I think the last time we used River Rock was that project. I think everything's been limestone since then because of the costs. Uh, limestone's just been a lot cheaper than River Rock. I can't even get River Rock right now. In fact, our last restoration project was like a rock concrete mixture, I think, um, just because the culch is kind of hard to get right now. Um, hey, Emma, can you please explain a little bit more about the bagless dredging that you guys use to uncover those sedimented over reefs? Yeah, so um, this is <laughs> this is a really interesting concept. There are some cases in which it's argued that dredging can be used to resurface oysters that have been smothered by sediment. It's a very narrow window in which that actually works, right? So if it, there's too much sediment, on top of it, you won't be able to resurface it. If it's not really sedimented over, you have incidental mortality from dredging always. And so it's just this very, very specific instance where after Hurricane Ike about, really depends on where you are, six inches to a foot of mud had covered most of these reefs. And so basically they just took the bags off of this dred the dredges and it, the, the teeth of the dredge were used to just resurface the material. Because if the material stays under the mud, obviously it becomes anoxic and black and you know the, the spat can't settle on it. So it's just bringing it to the surface before that could happen so it could still be a viable um, culch material for spat to settle on. Got it. So it needs to be like a fairly thick layer for that to work. Yeah, I mean, I, mean or... I, you know, I haven't done studies and that's the thing. Like, I, I feel like resource managers and industry members all along the coast talk about this idea of resurfacing or cleaning culture with dredges, but there's very little amount of, of scientific research done on what the actual sediment overburden needs to be for that to be effective. I would love to see some research done because I know that that's a management question in a lot of cases is when is that effective and when is that not? When is it causing more damage to do that versus when is it actually effective to resurface? So if anybody knows of studies that have been done, um, or is planning to do a study, please let me know because I, I can't find any literature actually specifying what the sediment overburden has to be for that to be effective. Emma, that's a good question. This is Carolina from Louisiana. Hi, Carolina. And we, we have the same issue. The industry always blaming, like we don't clean enough our reefs. Of course, we have 1.7 million acres of water bottoms, which is impossible to keep up with all the sedimentation that we have. And but we have noticed that they overwork the private leases, which they are always cleaning 
and they have a huge decline on spat settling on their reefs, even though they have clean coach material. And for some reason, I'm assuming is the overturning of the reefs, they are actually uh, delaying or avoiding, you know, like affecting recruitment. Yeah, there's definitely a point which where you can do it too much too. So, um, and we're, we're kind of having the similar conversation here where, you know, claims are being made that you have to, you have to turn these reefs or else, you know, they will sediment over time. And I think it's very, very site, it's site specific as well. And it depends how much sediment and when, and all of that. Um, I think that it's, it's a field of science that really needs to be developed further. Cause I, I, I do believe that managers are facing this issue all over the Gulf. Craig had a question. Hi, Craig. Hi, I have a couple of them, but you've uh, you touched on one, the bagless dredging. Um, did, do you know if it worked where you guys did it or you don't know? Um, um, we haven't gone back out with a sub bottom profiler to do it and monitored that specifically. Um, and we've done a ton of restoration since then. Christine, I, I can't think that we've taken any monitoring samples specifically for that purpose of evaluating that, did we? No, no, we haven't. Um, although I, I, it's, I don't, I tend to think that it, having sampled out there in East Bay, that it wasn't as effective as as, as our regular restoration is. Um, there's been some anecdotal research done on um, because once a shell is buried and it kind of gets that anoxic mud into that taste or whatever it is into the shell, even if it gets raised to the surface, spat are less likely to. Um, settle and grow on there than they are on uh, shell that's been exposed to the surface for longer periods of time. So it's probably not as effective as actually putting down culch material. We get much better results with those. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, we would like, we have that same question. We have and all kinds of anecdotal uh, answers for that same question. So that's what I was just wondering. I have two more if I can, I'll make them quick. First is uh, how do you how do you make them demonstrate use on the mariculture leases? And then the second one is just um, the, do you have a total for the cubic yards and the acreage since tw 2009? I think that's what you said when you started your enhancement stuff. Like they did enhancement stuff way before I was here and I have those numbers, but I didn't include them. Um, but that's I didn't know if you had if that's when you guys started it or you know there was stuff yeah. before that. So what we have data on is since 2009. There may have been small projects before then, but our database starts in 2009. I didn't start till 2013, so that was all before me. Um, so that's the 600 acres. I'd have to look up how many cubic yards that is, like what the volume of culture material has been, but it has been over 600 acres of culture placement and then the 1000 acres of bagless dredging. Uh, your first question I think was how do we ensure that they've met their minimum use criteria on the oyster farms? We have a very intensive um, kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Chain of custody process for all oysters that are moving. Understanding that prior to oyster mariculture starting 2019 in Texas, we did not let we did not allow import or introduction of oysters anywhere. No oyster from anywhere was ever coming into the state other than for eating, obviously to restaurants. So um, understanding that we were opening ourselves up to something very new, we went very conservative with this. And so every time oyster moves from one location to another, you have to send a form to the department and we will send you a letter authorizing it with a chain of custody that gets entered into a database. And so we know exactly how much is stocked at each of those um, each of those farms because they have to get signed approval from the department to import them from a hatchery out of state and then to place them out at their farm they have to report that to us and so we it, our minimum use criteria is stocked uh, seed stocking not harvest because we didn't want to make a minimum use criteria that might be dependent on you know you might have a bad season and it you know, you might just not be able to harvest that many. So we made it stocking instead of harvest. Okay, thank you. Um, I did see one question in the chat. I wasn't sure that if it got answered, but there was one about the funders, if they want us to report in terms of mosaic or um, 
actual restoration footbook, footprint. So far, the mosaic has been what we, we report to our funders and that's been fine. Um, understanding that even when we you know, would do these very large, well, in 2009, we were just doing large flat, you know, hundreds of acres, but uh, we would still, you know, in more recent years, we would do them in quarter acre clusters, because if you just restore in a huge area, then your oysters in the middle get a little bit deprived of food. So these clusters in this edge effect is actually really beneficial. So two at a point, that clustering and that mode is part of the restoration. And so it is a mosaic. And so funders have never really had an issue with it. But the question is from both sides, how big can that space be before it's not a continuous restoration? We're trying to answer that question from an applied science way, you know, an actual biological assessment. Um, but I would be interested to hear funders give feedback on, you know, how big that space can be from their perspective until it's not considered part of the restoration anymore. But so far, all of the ones that we've done, those spaces have been included in the, the um, reports to our funders. Thanks, Emma. That was actually my question. Um, Harold on his iPhone has a question. Harold can unmute. I think you have to press star six to unmute, I think. All right. I can't. Harold, we'll try to come back to you or you can email us or, um, or do it in the chat somehow, um, but sorry about that. Emma, if you, um, there's one question I didn't answer in the chat. What size stone are you using for restoration? So you wanna talk about that? I know it varies. It varies based on the project. Obviously, I talked about the self-policing culture. That's kind of an anomaly. Um, so back in the early 2010s, we were using a much smaller cult size because the industry preferred it. Uh, you know, this one inch, this little seed cult size, the tiny little rocks. Um, the industry preferred it because it was easier to clean. And they said that, you know, you have less mortality if you don't have to um, clean your oysters off of those rocks. But the problem is the rocks, the cult material gets removed when you harvest because of that. So we've actually started using an average or a median three inch size cult, um, which is a little bit, I mean, you do have to do more work culling that, uh, but the rock gets returned. Uh, in theory, back to the reef and you do that. So we just started using that three inch cult regularly about three years ago. Um, and those sites are all, so I, I didn't mention this. Um, so when we do a restoration, we do petition the commission for a two year closure on those sites to allow the oyster reefs time to repopulate and grow. Um, <clears throat> and basically get two full cohorts of market-sized oysters on those reefs. We get a market size. We go from zero to market in about six to seven months in our lower estuaries. Um, and so you get full, two full cohorts uh, if you do that. And so none of the research that we've done about cult size, spacing, any of this, we've actually been able to really assess the impact of dredging on yet. Um, so I couldn't really speak to whether the industry is happy with this new three inch size because technically the first one where we use that is just opening back up now for harvest. Sorry, that was way more information than you asked for, but it all kind of fed into the answer to your question. There was Ted who also asked a question about the, the um, House Bill 51 and whether or not we had broad support for that. And I just, I, I answered it in the chat, but I thought it was worth mentioning that um, the, the dealer culture placement aspect of HB 51 really got slipped into that bill at the very last minute. And it was more of a surprise to anybody else um, than this. So there, no, there was not broad support ahead of time just because nobody had even considered it. It just got slipped into that bill and it got, and then it passed. And even us at Parks and Wildlife, we were like, wait, wait a minute, what just, what just happened here? And how are we gonna implement that? So there was no, uh, funding it was supposed to kind of be funded from itself um, through the those that don't plant themselves that pay a tax the fee um, but it has definitely been a, a, a concern on staff um, we've made it happen and it has been successful and we are rebuilding reefs but it is an additional burden on staff and can be quite time consuming and we're still working through those kinks even though we've been doing these plants since 2018. 
but overall it's a good good thing. All right, well, um, thank you all very much. And thank you again, Emma and Christine and Craig for taking the time to prepare those and, and give those presentations. Um, we're just about out of time. Um, so just a couple of um, housekeeping things. Um, as Georgia mentioned, we'll be working on a, a sort of a, a place on our site where we can um, warehouse all this material for you. And we'll give you that information as soon as possible. Um, we do have, a, if anybody else wants to present their state program, you know, please let us know, Georgia or myself, and we'll see if we can either squeeze you in or set up a new date for another seminar if, any, if we see enough demand. And um, with the uh, Restore America's Estuaries Conference, uh, we'll probably be just checking in with you all and just seeing who's actually going to be in attendance. We'll have some logistics just to cover uh, with you at some point. So we're just, we'll check in with you on, on that. But, um, you know, please let us know if there's anything you all need from us, um, any questions or anything else. Um, but we are really appreciate everyone's time in this. And I'll let Georgia go ahead and close this up. Thank you everyone again. Um, great to see you all. I just put another message in the chat, no reason not to <laughs> double up on all of our communications here. Um, just a reminder, our next webinar, that we have scheduled is not until November 3rd, so we're skipping a week, um, but plenty of time for questions still to fly back and forth. I know um, Jason also fielded some questions from, from folks afterwards, so we're doing our best to keep that all in one place, share it out to you later on, and we're here for you in the meantime. So have a great rest of the week, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Craig. That was wonderful. We'll let you know if folks uh, get in touch with us for any questions.